Good? All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this week's Bible study. If you're uh, tuning in live on the live stream, if you are watching this video later, if you are here live with me, thank you for joining us. Uh, we are continuing this week in the conversation on interpretation and specifically on how the Bible interprets itself. So before we jump right into that, uh, we're going to go ahead and read our guiding verse for this whole series, which is Psalm 119, verse 105. It says this, Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. Well, let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for gifting us with your revelation. I pray that we would honor it, that we would be true to it, that we would seek through the power of your spirit to be changed by it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so last week we began the conversation of what does it look like, what does it mean when I say that the Bible interprets itself? You may remember that for the kind of previous two weeks before that, we were looking at two different methods of biblical study. There was the, uh, the, the journey, the interpretive journey, and then there was the uh, updated version of the inductive Bible study that we looked at. And uh, I said, while interpretation is a, a part of both of them, really, it's not our job to just simply interpret, but rather to seek to understand, seek to know, and seek to grasp God's word. And so uh, part of the reason is because the Bible does a really good job of interpreting itself. And so when we ask the question, how do we interpret this, the, the reality is <clears throat> we should seek to allow the Bible to answer that question for us, because it does most of the time. Um, we began to look at the first of three different lenses that we will use to describe uh, biblical interpretation. The first and the one that we looked at last week was the Old Testament use of the Old Testament. So the way in which Hebrew Bible authors used, understood, and applied other Hebrew Bible authors and the writings that came before them. We looked at a couple of different books. We looked at Psalm 1, which is uh, among the writings. It's, it's some of the most beautiful and important Hebrew poetry that exists. And then we looked at Zephaniah, one of the minor prophets, one of the prophets uh, around the, right before the Babylonian exile. And we looked at how did they use and understand God's word that had come before them. So this week we're going to look at the second of those which is the New Testament use of the Old Testament. So how did the New Testament authors, the post-Messiah, so post-risen Jesus authors, understand, use, and interpret the Old Testament or all of the writings that they had before them? So I first want to say that the New Testament authors are constantly doing this. They do this all the time, whether directly or indirectly, whether they do a quote or even a whole passage or they uh, allude to something that was before them. So when we say, how does this happen? We, we, we really need to first understand that this happens all the time and we need to get good at seeing it happening. So how does the New Testament use the Old Testament? Well, there is a very, very quick, very simple answer which is where we will begin. The New Testament authors uh, seem to constantly be looking at the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus. Jesus is their picture of the Old Testament. When they read the Hebrew Bible, when they read the writings that were from before them, so if you remember the Hebrew Bible, there's the, uh, the Torah, there's the Nevi'im, the prophets, and there's the Ketuvim, the writings. So when they look at those three portions of Scripture that they had available to them, they see Jesus everywhere. <clears throat> so before we move on, 
the reality is this should cause us to stop immediately. The simple fact that the New Testament authors constantly use the Old Testament in reference to Jesus should absolutely stop us and perhaps cause us to reconsider how we view and read the Old Testament ourselves. It should, it should redirect the way that we read Old Testament scripture, the narrative, the Hebrew uh, poetry, the different points of discourse, whatever that we're reading. It should always cause us to go, okay, where, where is Jesus in this? How do I see, do I see Jesus in this? And so I, I want to say quickly, though, <clears throat> that I am not suggesting that everything in the Old Testament is immediately, directly pointing to Jesus. There are people who make that claim. There are lots of people who make that claim. Some really, really smart people make that claim. Martin Luther made that claim. That, that everything in the Old Testament points directly to Jesus. Now, I am not suggesting that. I don't think that that's the case. I think that there are a lot of Old Testament scriptures that indirectly point to Jesus, that allude to Jesus, that thematically or, or kind of the feeling, the tension that's in the text points us to Jesus. Um, that not necessarily that it all is immediately directly pointing to Jesus. Now, I could totally be wrong, and I will be the first to admit that there is a good chance that in many of these things, I don't have quite all of it together. But I can teach you the way that I've been taught and the way that I've learned, and, I, and I'm suggesting to you that rather than reading the Old Testament and seeing, uh, for instance, like when we read in the book of uh, Genesis, how does the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife point directly to Jesus? Well, we don't have a story in the New Testament of Jesus inter interacting with a woman who is uh, pining for him and him saying no. But we do have plenty of stories of our, op of our opportunities uh, uh, of Jesus saying no to temptation around him. And then, in fact, there's two, Matthew 4 and in Luke 4, where Jesus is directly tempted. And so I'm not suggesting that um, when we read the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife, that that should make us immediately go, okay, that's pointing to Jesus with the devil in the wilderness. Slow down. <laughs> what I am saying is that when Joseph responds in righteousness, when faced with the things that his family did not respond to in righteousness. That should cause us to go, wait a second. God is doing something new and different in this person. And this person is responding to the mess and temptation around them in new and different ways. How did Jesus do that? How does that remind me of who Jesus is? Because ultimately, when we look at Jesus, we should see the perfect example, the perfect picture of who God is. And ultimately, that's what Scripture is doing for us. Amen? It's giving us a revelation of who God is. So, I just wanted to say that the Hebrew Bible as a whole, collectively, is pointing to the Messiah. I firmly believe that the whole story, the whole narrative from Genesis 1 on is getting us to the Messiah. And then that the, old, the New Testament authors pick up the reins of Scripture at that point, and they then say, that Messiah that we've been waiting for, that we've been watching for, that we've been uh, yearning to see, has come, and his name is Jesus. And this is who Jesus is. right? So that's how the Old Testament interacts with the New Testament. That's how the Hebrew Bible seems to be collectively understood by the New Testament authors. Now, I've just made a very sweeping, large statement we're going to break this down a little bit in looking at how that happens directly in the text. So, let's look at Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to look at a couple of different examples just like we did last week. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 1. So if you've got your Bible or if you need to pause the video here and go find your Bible, please do so. I'd love for us to be turning along in this together. So, Hebrews Chapter 1, verse 1 says this. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times 
and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited, as, is, as the name that he has inherited is superior to theirs. All right, let's stop there. So, when we look at the Bible, when we look at a passage of scripture, we should always have some questions that we come to it to understand it, right? We're trying to understand it in its own town, right? Grasp the text in its own town, or we're trying to see some observations, right? Um, if we were to look at these two different methods that we've used. So who is the audience that the author is writing to? Well, it's in the name, right? It's the Hebrews. It's, it would be the uh, Jewish believers who would have a, a background in the Jewish tradition, steeped in the Jewish writings, the Hebrew Bible, and who would read this and understand that this is very, very messianic, very much pointing to the Messiah. And so he starts with, so in the past, so before, the writings that we have, God spoke to our ancestors, those who were before us, through the prophets. But now he speaks to us through his son. All right, so we're already starting with something that should challenge the, the original audience, the Hebrews who are hearing this, God's son. Well, who has the right to be called God's son? That's a fairly large statement. In fact, in John, in the book of John, in uh, chapter 8, the, uh, Jesus makes the statement that he is God's son, and they get mad at him, they try to kill him, and there's a little footnote that John puts in it. It says, because Jesus was saying he was equal with God. So this is not just some kind of flippant statement to say that he has now spoken to us through his son. This is a drastic statement that someone has come, this Messiah has come, who is equal with God. And who can be equal with God? Well, none other but God. And so all of a sudden, this first sentence, if we, if we go quickly, we miss how much is being said here. So in these last days, he has spoken to us, spoken to us through his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. Okay, so not only is this his son, someone who's supposedly co-equal with God, this is also someone who is apparently supposed to be the one for whom all things have been made. He's the heir apparent to everything, and he's also the one who made it himself. Which, if we go back to the very, very beginning, who created? God. It's the very, very beginning of the whole thing. In the beginning God. So all of a sudden, Hebrews is really, really pulling from Jewish tradition and Jewish writings in just these first couple. And then in verse 3, he says this audacious statement. The Son, the one whom he's spoken to us through, who he has made heir apparent to all things and through whom all things were made. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Wow. Wow. He is everything that God is in his being set apart from us. In his, in his radiant glory, the sun is his radiance, and he's the exact representation of his being. When you see Jesus, his son, you see God. The author of Hebrews is pulling on Jewish writings and traditions in these first couple of verses to make it without any question, without any hesitation, He's saying Jesus is 
God, which should fly in the face of all of what we've understood from the Old Testament, right? Because how often do you hear, the Lord God, the Lord is one. I am the Lord your God. You shall have none before me. I, the God, the only God, who rescued you with my righteous right hand, pulled you from Egypt. I am the Lord, and I know none before me. Right? God has all of these large, sweeping statements about he being the only one, and here the author of Hebrews is leading us to see Jesus as God as well. Wow. Wow. And then the author of Hebrews does something pretty crazy. From after the first four verses, from verse 5 on through the rest of what is now the first chapter, the author of Hebrews quotes the Old Testament. And he doesn't just quote a couple, one or two things. In fact, here's all of the quotes that he pulls out of. He pulls from Psalm 2. 2 Samuel 7, 1 Chronicles 17, Deuteronomy 32, Psalm 104, Psalm 45, Psalm 102, and Psalm 110. Now, that is a hefty list. And to us as New Testament believers, who are a couple thousand years separated from Jewish writings and tradition of the time that this was written, and who are not steeped in Jewish writings and tradition, we see this as we go, oh yeah, Jesus, of course Jesus is the one. But again, let's take a step back, put ourselves in the shoes of the original audience who are the Hebrews among that day, and we'll just pull out a couple of these. So 2 Samuel 7, it's actually verse 14 that he's quoting. 2 Samuel 7 is what is called the Davidic uh, covenant. The Davidic covenant where God says to David, On your line, from you will come one who will sit on my throne forever. This Davidic promise that someone will come who will be of David's line and yet who will reign eternally. This covenant was understood to be a messianic covenant. Because what else could it be other than something from God if it was going to be someone who would reign forever? In fact, let me take a step back. The number one reason that I've heard personally, not saying that this is the the number one reason, period, but at least in my experience, the number one reason that I've heard personally from Jewish believers who refuse Jesus as Messiah, the reason they say he was not Messiah is because he did not establish an eternal throne from which he reigned from in the way they expected Is Jesus sitting on the throne right now in Jerusalem? Literally, physically? No, he's not. And so to the Jewish believer, that means Jesus is not Messiah. We, though, step into the New Testament text and we look at it and we see, oh man, Jesus is absolutely reigning from a throne of eternity. And will one day come back as the conquering king to conquer in that way. And will once again establish the perfect peace that only the king can. Just like the promise that David was given. So 2 Samuel 7 was already understood immediately to be a Messiah who had to be from God. Psalms 45, 102, and 110, for instance, were all understood to be messianic psalms. Were all understood to be only, uh, could only be talking about someone other than a man. Let's look at Psalm 110 quickly. Verse 1 says this The Lord says to my Lord. All right, so already, already we have a problem. It says, Yahweh says to my Lord. So Yahweh, who is the Lord, is now saying to someone that David, the supposed author, we assume, the assumed author at least, who is the king, And who would be the only other person that would be referred to as my Lord. So when others come to David, they would call him my Lord. It happens all the time. You can read it. Anytime someone comes to a king, that's what they say. Again, let's go back to Joseph. What did Joseph call uh, 
Pharaoh and then what did Joseph's brothers call Joseph as second in the land? They called him my Lord. So that's not abnormal, but it's really abnormal for the king to be the one to say it. So he says, Yahweh says to my Lord. He doesn't say Yahweh says to me. Yahweh says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Another way to say that is sit in a place that is equal to the throne I sit on. Until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Until I conquer all things so that you would sit over them. In fact, the author of Hebrews picks this up and says, who could be saying this? Who could this be about other than the Messiah? It can't be David. First of all, we know that David wouldn't talk about himself in that way. He never talks about himself in that third person kind of way. And then second of all, we know that David didn't have his enemies beneath his feet for all eternity, sitting at the right hand of God. (laughs) So clearly this isn't David that this is supposed to point us to. And Hebrews picks this up. The author of Hebrews says that's that's Jesus. We're not going to look at the rest of them, but the rest of this list were already understood to be messianic before they even read the, the, the letter from the author of Hebrews. So they would have already had an understanding this was supposed to point us to someone and Hebrews picks this up and he says, this is Jesus. In fact, the book of Hebrews continues to do this on and on and on and on throughout the whole book. A little sidebar, uh, in one of my classes I, I took a lot of Bible and a lot of theology classes. And in one of my Bible classes I, I took, it was on the epistles. So the, not the Gospels or Acts or Revelation, essentially. So everything else in the New Testament, the epistles. And we went through a project where we had to uh, journal while reading Scripture. And I chose to read Hebrews. And... Uh, We were supposed to simply just journal our insights, things that were coming about in our readings. We were supposed to do it three days a week for ten weeks. So it was a pretty big project. Um, I I did the project three days a week for ten weeks. I wrote 36 pages of notes uh, on my computer. I got through the first four chapters. That's it. Why? Because Hebrews is thick dripping with so much content from the scriptures that came before it that really, really impact the way that we can read and understand the book itself. Now, I'm going to address here in a little bit if that means that we need to know all of scripture that came before in the New Testament to fully understand the New Testament. So we'll get there in a little bit. Um, I want to look at one more example before we do that in the New Testament use of the Old Testament, the New Testament's understanding and application of the Scriptures. Now, this one we looked at a bunch of different ones that is kind of thematic and holistic in nature. I want to look at a specific application. So we're going to look at Mark chapter 11. So I've got it up here, and in fact, I'm just going to simply read it from the slides. So... Mark chapter 11, verses 7 through 11. It says this. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now, we've already looked at 2 Samuel 7 and Psalm 110, both Davidic moments of talking about the Davidic covenant and promise. So hopefully you heard a little bit of that in this 
Mark 11, right? Here comes the coming kingdom of David. They're talking about Jesus. This is the triumphal entry, if you don't know this portion of Scripture. This is the triumphal entry where Jesus rides in to Jerusalem on a donkey. This is the end of his earthly ministry. In fact, this is only one week. This is the beginning of the week that would eventually be the, the cross and resurrection. And Jesus rides on a donkey, on a colt, and he is received as a war king. These, these triumphant yells are, are like those of a king who has just conquered his enemies, who comes in and is received with palm branches and olive branches laid on the road in honor of Jesus and their cloaks laid out in honor of Jesus. And he rides in and they yell, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save us, Lord, save us. They call him the one, the coming kingdom of David, the, the expected conqueror. They expect that Jesus is coming in and he's going to throw down with Rome and take them out. That's not what he does. So Mark is throwing us back to another specific uh, psalm, Psalm 118. He points us to Psalm 118, verse 25, because that's what he directly does. But just like I've said in this uh, reading of Matthew, Mark is not only pointing us to verse 25. He's not only expecting that we think that Mark is somehow like pulling uh, his favorite lyric from his favorite psalm and applying it to Jesus. That's not what the New Testament authors do. They are pointing us to sections of of Scripture, And so let's read Psalm 118. We're going to start in verse 15. It says this. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. Yahweh's right hand has done mighty things. Yahweh's right hand is lifted high. Yahweh's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and I will, pro and will proclaim what Yahweh has done. Yahweh has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to Yahweh. This is the gate of Yahweh through which the righteous may enter. I will give thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation." The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Yahweh has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Yahweh has done, uh, has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Yahweh, save us. Yahweh, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. From the house of Yahweh we bless you. Yahweh is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, to Yahweh, for he is good. His love endures forever. Hmm. I would suggest that if we do not see Jesus all over this section of Scripture, we probably need to read our Bibles a little bit more. In fact, several of these verses are picked up by other New Testament authors in other ways talking about Jesus. See, Jesus, he will be the one who enters the gates of the righteous. He is the stone rejected by the builders He's the one who will save. And it's, it's actually his name, Jesus. It means the Lord saves, right? Yahweh saves. He will be the one who saves. He is the one who comes from the house of the Lord. He is our God and he is worthy of praise. Jesus is all over these 15 verses. In fact, all of Psalm 118, I would suggest, points us to Jesus. In fact, all of the Psalms, I would suggest, points us to Jesus. 
seems to me like that's what the New Testament authors are suggesting themselves, that they understand the Hebrew Bible to point us directly to Jesus. So, then, if Jesus is the fulfillment of the Hebrew Bible and is constantly used as such by the New Testament authors, what does it mean to us as believers? Do we need to know and understand the Hebrew Bible to know and understand the New Testament? Well, I will give two answers to this question. First and foremost, no. Here's why. I fully believe that the New Testament, as it has been given to us, is itself sufficient in giving, in its giving to lead us to who Jesus is, to what he has done, and to how to be saved. That the New Testament on its own is completely sufficient to show us that we need Jesus, to show us that Jesus has given us himself to us, and to show us that we can be saved by him. I am convinced that the Holy Spirit has been given to us to lead us into understanding. And that he will guide us into understanding who Jesus is, who God is, who we are in light of that, and who we are to the world. So my first answer is, do we need to know and understand the Hebrew Bible in order to understand the New Testament? No. My second answer is that while we don't need to know, that we don't need to understand all of the Hebrew Bible, that it absolutely and without a doubt aids us in understanding and helps us to fight the easy urge to reinterpret scriptures instead of using scriptures in the way that they were intended. Let me put it to you this way. The New Testament authors, as they were writing, they themselves had scripture in mind. Yes? But was the scripture that they had in mind, the scripture that they were writing and the ones that were being written around them, or was the scripture that they had in mind what came before them, namely the Hebrew Bible? I would suggest that it was the Hebrew Bible that they had in mind. We've seen that in Matthew. Matthew brings it up how often that this was to fulfill scripture. That keeps coming up again and again, right? That this thing that Jesus did, this thing that was said about Jesus or done around Jesus or because of Jesus, that these were to fulfill scripture, right? Again and again and again, we are being pointed to the Hebrew Bible by the New Testament authors. And so if they had in mind the Hebrew Bible while they were writing it, would it not aid us to have the Hebrew Bible in mind while we read it? Of course it would. And in fact, I would argue that's, that's how it is supposed to be. That's, in fact, the way it's been given to us. That's the way it's been organized. It's the way it's been revealed. And we have them available to us. I think something that happens in New Testament believers is that we get stuck in the, the last third of our Bible. And we forget the first two-thirds. Now, the last third is the most important. The last third tells us all about what Jesus has done. It tells us all about that Jesus has accomplished everything necessary for our righteousness and our salvation. Hallelujah. But the first two-thirds, well, it's, it's not just backstory. It's not just supposed to fill in some time. It tells us, all about who Jesus is, all about what God has done, and all about who we're supposed to be in response to that. Right? And so if the New Testament authors have the Old Testament scriptures in mind as they write, of course it would absolutely 
aid us in our own pursuit of these scriptures ourselves. In fact, many of the New Testament scriptures that we know by heart are just repurposed Old Testament scripture, are just reapplied to Jesus because that's who they were supposed to point to in the first place. So, Do we need to know and understand the Hebrew Bible to know and understand the New Testament? No and yes. And my hope, my prayer, and the entire point of us doing this together is that you would, that we would, that we would fall in love with God's word. That we would seek him, that we'd seek to love him in this way that we would bring to mind the scriptures that were meant to uh, aid us in our day-to-day, in our actual, real, physical, tangible, timely walk with our Lord. So next week, we are going to look at uh, the the last of the three lenses, the the New Testament use (coughs) of the New Testament. That might seem a little weird, That might seem like there won't be much, but the reality is there's quite a bit. Turns out the New Testament authors hung out. Turns out the New Testament authors talked about theology and stuff. Turns out the New Testament authors read one another's work and reference it a decent amount. And so next week we're going to look at how does the New Testament treat the New Testament. (sighs) Okay, so we are going to continue our uh, look at Matthew. We've got a long, well, not a long, we've got a a, a decent chunk of Scripture today, and we've got a decent amount of time to to look at it. Um, I must admit, though, that while I am ready, I am nowhere near as ready as I would like to be for today. So normally when I'm prepping for this, I I try to read through the whole section three times at least. Um, And I've been able to do that, praise God. I've been able to stay on track. This is not a week that I was able to stay on track with that. Uh, I hope that would make sense, given this week for me has been a fairly big one. It's been a fairly emotional one. It's been a fairly important one. Um, We had our youth group prom on Friday, which was an amazing event and yet so much work. And then today, in case you did not hear yet, uh, I announced that I will be stepping down from Cascade Park at the end of June um, and moving forward with with trusting God and following him into what's next. Um, And so uh, we are going to go through these quickly. Uh, I hope to bring about something in the text that Uh, is insightful. Please excuse if I do not. (laughs) So, Matthew chapter 13. So, as we've read, we've gotten to this point where uh, Jesus, he has uh, begun teaching, right? He has this teaching ministry where he is teaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near and he begins to teach things of the kingdom. He begins to heal. He's healing the lame, the sick, the forgotten. He is particularizing people compassionately. He's calling his disciples one by one. And finally, it kind of comes to a full stop in Matthew chapter 9 when we see the calling of the last disciple, Matthew himself, the tax collector, who Jesus hangs out with. And Throughout this whole thing, Jesus is shown in comparison to kind of like two different figures, the Pharisees of the day and their pious righteousness that is really just a covering of righteousness that isn't actually internal, which is what Jesus calls out so much, especially in the Sermon on the Mount. And then this guy, Moses, right? So let me step back again. See, if we don't have reference to the Old Testament, we don't have reference to who Moses is, we miss a lot of what Matthew was doing in his gospel. Does that mean that we don't understand or can't believe in what Matthew writes about? Absolutely not. We absolutely can uh, follow along with who Jesus is and what he has done, but when we see how Matthew is using Moses to compare us to Jesus, then we see a lot more depth 
in his book. And so Jesus uh, continues to uh, do these wonderful miracles, and then he does this crazy thing in chapter 10. He sends out his disciples to go and do the same thing, and then uh, they come back, and he tells them, yeah, that's what the kingdom is like. It's hard. And then there's these continued teachings in 11 and 12 that the kingdom of heaven, though it's good, and the kingdom that Jesus is establishing, though it's right, is hard. And he begins to show them, actually, the kingdom doesn't look like the kingdom of this world. And starting in, ver- in chapter 13, we begin to see a lot of teaching, a lot of teaching about the kingdom and how the kingdom of God looks different than the king- excuse me, kingdoms of the world. And there's all of these parables and Parables, while we've heard a couple thus far, there's really this long section of parables in what we read for today, that these parables are these snippets of narrative stories that are supposed to teach us a lesson. So in the same way, we should, we should understand this well because we do this in our culture as well, especially through children's stories, right? We have these stories that are supposed to teach us patience or humility or compassion, or uh, empathy, or confidence, or whatever it is. We have these children's stories. And really, the way that we use children's stories are examples of parables. And so a parable may or may not be a real, true, eventful story. It may or may not have happened. That's not the point. The point of these stories is not that we have an actual moment in history, but rather that we have a thematic teaching that has a specific application that's supposed to teach us about who Jesus is and about what his kingdom looks like. And so these parables that are kind of told back to back to back are all about the kingdom of heaven, which, as Matthew's already told us, is what Jesus is teaching about. And so especially chapter 13, there's a bunch of parables all teaching us about the kingdom of heaven. Now, as I've said before, when we understand scripture through the lens of biblical theology, when we have that as the framework through which we read God's word, it helps us not be so systematic, not be so analytically logical about it. And so Here's the reality. Some of these parables are told in other books, Matthew and Mark and Luke, and these parables are not told in the same order or even sometimes at the same time. That's okay because that's not what Matthew is doing. He's not trying to give us a chronological vision of Jesus' life. He's trying to give us a theological vision of Jesus' life. Mark and Luke are not trying to give us a perfectly chronological vision of Jesus' life. They're giving us theological visions of Jesus' life. Matthew starts his entire book, verse 1, the very beginning of his entire writing, with this is the genealogy of Jesus who is the Messiah. Well, we we don't even know who the Messiah is until we see the Messiah rise again because that was what was foretold in the scriptures. And so Matthew tells us right away that he is writing from a perspective that is theological, not chronological, because he's already told us that Jesus must have already died because that had to happen for the Messiah. So I, I just bring that up for us to not get caught up in these weird arguments that come about around things like this, especially chapter 13, where these parables are told in different orders and in different ways by other uh, of the New Testament authors. It's not because somehow this isn't true or somehow details were forgotten. It's because they're writing from a very theological, specific perspective. All right, jumping into chapter 14, we see uh, Jesus... uh, responds to what happens around John, and then we see him uh, withdraw. Look at, let's, let's look at uh, verse 13. So his cousin, his friend, his, 
his co-laborer for the kingdom, has just died. And verse 13 says, When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Oh, if your Bible has any titles over different paragraphs or sections, you probably have the title, Jesus Feeds the 5,000. We know this story. Jesus is teaching the crowds and his disciples come to him and they're like, hey, we got to give them some food. And he's like, hey, why don't you feed them? And they're like, we have nothing. And then little boy's lunch, right, the loaves and the fish. And Jesus thanks God for it, blesses it, and then begins to break it apart and feeds, right, probably over 15,000 people because there was just 5,000 men plus the women and children. And so Jesus feeds them. But have you ever noticed that this section starts with this verse? When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. See, I, when I look at chapter 14 and really 13 on, I, I see kind of these two things come right into contact with one another. I see Jesus' full humanity and I see Jesus' full divinity come into a crashing stop with one another in this section. Jesus is grieving his friend. He has compassion on the crowds. And then he does the craziest thing. He divinely responds miraculously provides. Immediately after this, he sends the disciples away. They go out on the boat and a storm comes and Jesus walks out on the storm and on the waves and they see him, they're afraid and Jesus is like, guys, don't be afraid, it's me. It's me. It's, it's Jesus, your rabbi. Peter says, if it really is you, tell me to come. And Jesus says, Come. And then Peter got out on the boat, got out of the boat and onto the waves, and to my knowledge, becomes the second person in history to walk on water. I think we give Peter a pretty bad rep, but I've never walked on water before. I don't know if you have. So that's pretty crazy. Peter sees the wind, though. His eyes turn away from Jesus, and he begins to sink, and he calls out for help. And it says, immediately, Jesus came to him, grabbed him by the hand, pulled him out of the waves, and said, why did you doubt, oh, you who have little faith? Think about what Jesus just said. He just called the one who faithfully got out of the boat onto the waves that once scared him to walk upon them. And Jesus says, you have little faith. I don't think this is Jesus belittling Peter. That doesn't make sense in the story. Right? So what is Jesus doing? He is, he's talking about that the, the object of faith is him. Again, addressing his divinity. That the focus of faith is him. We get into chapter 15 and we get further teaching on the kingdom. We get further crashing of Jesus' humanity and divinity. And he he is teaching, he's healing, he's caring for compassionately. We get into 16 and we see what I see as the, the crux of Peter's life with Jesus. What, of, what is probably the most important moment for Jesus and Peter in chapter 16. We see Jesus come to his disciples and it's, it's almost as if he's pastorally quiet with them. And he says, who, who do people say I am? What is, what is said about me? What, what, what do they think I'm doing? Do they get it? And they replied, well, some, some say you're John the Baptist, which we know isn't true. Some say you're Elijah, which we know isn't true. Still others say Jeremiah or, or maybe some of the other prophets. You're, just, you're one of these who have already come. You're, you're just like someone else. And Jesus says, who, who do you say I am? 
And Peter says, you are the Messiah. The son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For you did not have this for yourself. This has been revealed to you by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. He called him Simon. And then he called him Peter. He called him Pebble. And then he called him Rock. He says, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And what Whatever you bind on earth, I will bind in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, I will loose in heaven. Then he ordered them to not tell anyone. Which is interesting. It kind of becomes this messianic secret, which kind of becomes a theme between now and the cross in the book of Matthew. And of course, what comes after that? Well, if Jesus is talking about He's going to establish his church. He's going to give the keys of the kingdom to the disciples, namely Peter. What has to come to happen? We know the story because we're on the other side of it. Jesus has to die. And in fact, that's what he then tells them. He tells them he's going to suffer many things in Jerusalem. And he's going to die. By the way, he's telling them that as they're on the way to Jerusalem... On the road to Jerusalem, he says, yeah, when we get there, it's not going to be just a normal Passover. I'm going to suffer many things and then die. And then into chapter 17, after about a week, Jesus uh, shows to his three, his big three, Peter, James, and John, who he really is. And he takes him on a mountain And they see Moses and Elijah, and it's this uh, brilliant sight, and Jesus is glowing. He's so bright in his holiness, and he's showing them who he is. See, this is Jesus' divinity once again. He continues to heal, to cast out demons, to teach gets into chapter 18, and he continues to teach in this way that says, my kingdom is different. His kingdom does not look like the kingdom of the world. His kingdom is one of humility. His kingdom is one that is other-focused, servant-hearted. His kingdom is one that seeks those who are lost His kingdom is one that deals with conflict and confrontation in righteousness instead of in self-righteousness. That seeks to restore instead of tear down. His kingdom is one that is forgiving and merciful. His kingdom does not look like the kingdom of the world. Then he gets into chapter 19 and he begins to teach on his kingdom in a new way. And really his, his kingdom uh, is one that is for freedom. It is one that is supposed to free people into new life. Instead of shame them or oppress them, he teaches on divorce. He teaches against the prevailing misunderstandings of uh, one specific verse that is taken out of context in the Old Testament. Instead, he's reteaching them to understand that it's God's heart that the establishment of marriage would reflect the covenant that he makes with his people. Then he corrects his friends about children. And he says, no, this is what you're supposed to look like actually And then he 
kind of does the unthinkable and he says, yeah, the kingdom of God, it's, it's not for the greatest. In fact, it's for the least. In fact, if you are like those who are the greatest, it's going to be pretty much impossible for you to get in. In fact, it's easier for a camel to walk through the eye of a needle than for one who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then I love this, love this line. When the disciples hear this, they're astonished and they say, Who then? Who then may enter the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus replies, well, with man this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. That's his point. It's not about what you have. It's not about who you are, the status you carry, the riches you gain. It's not about any of those things. Those things are of the world. The kingdom does not look like the world. It's not possible for you on your own, but with God, it is possible. And then, in chapter 20, we really begin this race for Jerusalem. There's continued teaching in uh, parables of the kingdom. There's continued uh, teaching of that his kingdom does not look like the kingdom of the world. There's continued teaching of Jesus needing to die. And finally, he continues to heal. In fact, he heals two of their blindness as he gets to Jerusalem. And in chapter 21, which we'll pick up next week, we get to Jerusalem. And we get to the final week of Jesus' life. Some beautifully powerful, beautifully important moments that happen, incredibly important teachings that Matthew is trying to get us to understand because it's all about the kingdom and it's all about the authority that Jesus has that looks way different than the authority that the Pharisees have or even that Moses had. It's all about Jesus the Messiah who is ushering in a new kingdom. All right. So next week, we are in, is it 21 through 25? Is that right? 24. Okay. 21 through 24. So a much shorter section than the one that we've just read. Uh, but we are in just our final two weeks of lessons. Uh, so uh, I hope that this has continued to be edifying. Next week, we will talk about the New Testament use of the New Testament and the uh, s- almost end of the book of Matthew. So... Be blessed. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you next week.